So, several people today spoke about homesickness and missing home. So, first, it's interesting to think about home in terms of the Freudian notion of the pleasure principle and the boom or the egg that we spoke about last week. Um, but in addition to that, perhaps there is some kind of <coughs> general homesickness or, um, yeah, that is associated with being an artist. Perhaps, and this is just a speculation, do with it whatever you like, but perhaps by choosing to become an artist, you really leave your home because you become very different from everyone in your family. And it often happens that actually the more successful you are at making art, the more painful it becomes because you feel that your art takes you away from your family, from your home, from the people with whom you are the closest. Because with every success, the gap widens. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how, um, how there is a certain pain in being an artist. The pain of not being who you used to be before that. Yeah? And I don't know if you ever had this experience of going back to the family and they ask you about your studies and you tell them something. <laughs> And there is this complete lack of understanding. They don't get what you do, and you cannot pretend any longer that you are the same person you used to be. And if you do pretend, if you feel that you do yourself an injustice, and if you remain loyal to yourself, then they say, oh, he or she puts on airs, things that better than us, you know? And it's a real issue, you know? It's, it's not something to sort of, uh, it's something to really think about. How do you keep a relationship with the past while also allowing yourself to change? Uh, the only way I can think about it is that it takes a long time. You cannot solve these things at once. You just need to think about the relationship with home as something that you know, develops over long periods and undergoes many changes, but it is very painful and, and difficult. So um, I often notice, uh, we as, as tutors often notice that uh, the success in art doesn't always bring happiness. Sometimes often notice it. Yeah? Because it creates this separation. And I'm trying to talk about it now in slightly Freudian yeah. Because we're going back to Freud uh, in a minute. Um, but in a sense, the family very much runs on the reality principle. And as by becoming an artist, you kind of say, well, I sort of want to live by the pleasure principle. I want to have more pleasure in my life. I want to do things not because they're useful, but because they give pleasure. And that is often experienced by others as an insult. Yeah? So that's just um, a kind of way to link what we discussed so far with, um, with the conversation that seems to be developing here around the table. Re regarding the coronavirus, I was interviewed yesterday uh, some um, people who applied to the course, um, they have a huge amount of applications this year. So, um, Pat and I have been interviewing like, almost one day a week. It just, of course, completely to interview. So, I was speaking to someone um, in China, and she was sitting there in kind of in a big fur coat, and she said that the, there is no heating and for a long time, for, for three weeks, there was no heating, and no one can leave the house, and police are very violent. He said, police are as usually very nice and polite, but now they're really violent and they shout at you to go indoors and they don't let you go outside. And she said, many people died. And, uh, and it was just really a 
incredibly moving and, uh, and powerful. And she said, will you still accept me even if there is a virus in China? And um, yeah, it was just really somehow strong, you know, because it was self like, speaking to someone who, uh, who lives in a, in a city under siege, in a city that is um, quarantined. I don't know if you, if it happened for, for anyone else to speak to... Uh, you know? I want to say something, uh, yeah. because my, I, I saw news yesterday that because uh, uh, the animals, there is some concerns uh, and panic uh, with the animals. Yeah. So the government, they, uh, not the government, but the, the, the local government, some of the local government says, uh, we are to, going to kill the animals of your house, maybe the cats, something else. And uh, one of the citizens, uh, his or her cats, was buried uh, alive by the, by, by the people. But the citizen, his or, uh, he or she, that didn't uh, protect this animal, this cat. And, uh, and the, after that, his or her mind just, uh, be, uh, just uh, went to pop. It's, it's crazy because... And uh, there's another news that uh, some of the... Uh, how do you say, some of the community just opposed uh, uh, opposed that uh, we are going to just uh, kill your animal, kill you the past in your home. And all of the residents just uh, said, who are you? How could mm. you? Who are you? Yeah, how could you speak this? And then they changed the policy. Mm. So I think it's about so what you, the people should know uh, when to stop. Yeah. When to st stop yourself and when to stop others to, yeah. to yeah. That's a... In the end, it's not the virus that really kills, it's the society that kills. You know, the virus only removes, well, if you think about it in terms of the Freudian ego, id, and superego, yeah, and how in everyday life we manage to keep these things in balance, when something like a virus happens, the balance disappears. And then different things start to come out that we normally keep kind of under control, you know? Um, so, for that reason, it, there is a lot of kind of violence and aggression and craziness. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay, so I think really this is such an important text that we're reading now. And it's not easy because as I told you, Freud wrote it for a medical journal, for a journal for practicing psychoanalysts. Hi. 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 Take a seat, too. Uh, do you want just to tell us quickly your name and what you're working on at the moment? Okay. Uh, so, um, no, that's, sorry, that's, uh, 
So, um, so as I, as I started to say, um, this short article was written for a journal of practicing psychoanalysts. So it was written um, for a professional publication. It, even though it is one of the one of most popular texts um, uh, that Freud has written, um, it's not it's not the most flowing and the most easy to read. But I think it's so important and it's kind of worth our time to really go through it and understand what Freud is saying because his whole or large part of his conception of the psyche of the inner workings um, of the person are within this text. So, so and I need to pause here. Would you like, after you catch your breath, would you like to tell us your name and what are you working on? I didn't hear that. Getting control of your time. Okay, that's uh, that's good. Um, okay, fine. Uh, now, this there is this this whole book that I just recently got um, is about this one essay. It's it's a book of uh, contemporary essays by um, psychoanalysts and therapists and other um, scholars of psychoanalysis. The whole book is just about this one essay. Uh, and it is quite very interesting. If, if Freud is something you want to explore further, that's probably not the first thing you need to read, the better text. If you want to get to know Freud a little better, then one of the best starting points is a book that's called uh, Psychopathology of Everyday Life. Interesting title, uh, because what is psychopathology? Um, pathological, what is, what is something pathological? What is pathology? When we say that someone is pathological. Have you met? Have you heard of this word before? Yes. What, what, what is uh, pathological or pathology? No? A recurring kind of pattern behavior. Exactly. It's something obsessive, um, disease. Yeah? Psychopathology is the mental disturbances of everyday life. So in this book, Freud talks about the way we sometimes speak one word instead of another. Accidentally. But he says there are no accidents. He really pays attention to the way we misremember names and call one person by another name. And he says, this is never an accident. There is an underlying wish or underlying unconscious desire that makes you replace one name with another. And he has loads of examples. Uh, it's, really, it's really fascinating how, he says, what does it mean, for instance, if you forget your keys. If you don't know where your keys are when you leave the house. So some people say, I just don't have any good memory or I forgot where I put them. But Freud says, well, no, it is to do with perhaps not wanting to leave the house or not wanting to go where you're supposed to go. There is, the, there is always underlying cause. And in the sense, the task of psychoanalysis 
is to work with these random, apparently random, everyday occurrences and extract from them some meaning. So it's a fascinating book, and it really is written in a way that anyone can read and it's quite accessible. So I would su suggest to those of you who are interested in getting a little bit deeper into Freud and psychoanalysis, start with the psychopathology of everyday life. Uh, yes. Is that in the essay what he calls catexis? The catexis is in this essay as well. Well, catexis is, is, is just this very unfortunate technical term. Uh, but I, I, should, I don't know if he talks there about it. It's possible. Uh, it's quite a big book. It has, um, it has chapters on jokes, on why people um, go books. For Freud, jokes are always an expression of a kind of violence. Um, why people forget things, why people mis they misremember things, uh, misspeak, uh, or let's say go to the wrong address instead of, you know, um, knock on the wrong door. This kind of thing. Um, but the one thing that you really take out of this book is that. There are no maximums. Everything has some significance, which I think is also important when you come to think about your practice and your installs. And you know how often, and I think it can come across as, as quite annoying when you make something, and instead of talking about your work, Pat and I talk about the nail you hang it up, <laughs> or the string it is that dug it from the ceiling. And you say, well, it's not about the string. But if Freud, thought of anything is that everything has significance. The nail, the string, the blue tack that you use, the glue, you know, that maximizes in work as well. And so what is the significance? What is the meaning? And how do you tease out these things? Um, so without pointing any fingers at all, uh, you could apply that to those people who, for instance, came late today to the class. Of course, it could be an accident, the, the, the train could be delayed, but Freud might say, well, but perhaps there is a different reason for why you were late. Maybe you didn't want to be here, you know? Or maybe you didn't want to meet someone here. Or maybe you thought that there would be an encounter that you generally would rather avoid, you know? So, if you, for instance, had therapy, and you would speak to your therapist about being late today. And again, this is just, just an example, I think. I'm not, I don't, I don't, not really mean it seriously. But you could try to explore what was exactly the reason for being late. Yeah? All of these things have, for Freud, some kind of meaning. So the camera that we use today to film was not in the locker, it was not in the cage, it was in the locker. Okay, again, it's might be interesting to ask why. What was this is this is what Freud is getting. He says that everything that we do in our everyday life is on some level an expression of urges that we are not aware of. In all these little behaviors, our unconscious manifests itself in ways that we don't understand. But it's like spills over, like you know, if you boil water on the stove, some drops spill over, yeah, and they land on the stove and they psh. So, unconscious spills over like this in these little actions, and if we pay attention to them, we can really start learning things about ourselves. Yeah? For that reason, I told you last week, it's quite fascinating for an artist to have them and or counseling. Because it really allows you to start exploring the context and the motivations behind various behaviors. So, again, uh, go to uh, psychopathology of everyday life as the first step. In, Freud. In, in some past years, after I did a couple of lessons with Freud, uh, about Freud in the center, students came and said, can we have more Freud? We really want to, and we spent considerable amount of time just reading various um, texts, not only Freud, but just to get it deeper into uh, 
say about others. Um, so, now I just thought we will maybe go back to the text. And as we read, it might be helpful to think about the sort of presentations you offered here around the table when you spoke your name. Um, so, I think we have read this footnote. Uh, maybe, maybe let's read it again. Let's read it again. Footnote number three on page 2553 of the complete writings of Sigmund Freud. Uh, this one here. And by the way, anyone been to Freud's museum in Hampstead? Yeah. Sorry? This is the one in Vienna. The one in Vienna, you mean? Okay, yeah. Well, there is one in Hampstead, which is just around the corner. And we've been there uh, with our second year when the, well, one of the students, Marianne, installed their uh, work there. But um, at the moment, they have an exhibition about the uncanny. Uh, it's really good. And uh, so, I don't know, will, will, will you will make some sense? But that, uh, apropos psychopathology of everyday life, when we were in the museum, and um, Marianne was, uh, so someone was talking about the museum and said, now you know that uh, Freud uh, had a daughter, Anna Freud, who was also a psychoanalyst, and she specialized in working with children. And she lived in the same house with him, uh, upstairs, uh, on, on the top floor. So, uh, so someone said when we were there, she said, well, uh, Sigmund Freud lived in the, on the ground floor, and Anna Frank on the top floor. And, and this is a very Freudian, this is a kind of Freudian sleep, isn't it? Because it was Anna Freud, not Anna Frank. Anna Frank was a Jewish girl who was hiding from the Nazis in, on the top floor of her house, of a different house, in the attic. Yeah? And you might say, okay, this is just a genuine mistake because there are two very similar surnames, Freud and Frank, both begin with F, easy to mistake. But on the other hand, you think, well, maybe there is something deeper to that. Maybe Anna Freud was kind of hiding from her big, scary father in this attic, you know? Uh, maybe, maybe she was a little bit like Anna, 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 like Anna Frank, yeah? So I thought this is a really kind of interesting illustration of what Freud says, that, that these small mistakes can always get you to something deeper that is going on. Yeah? In a sense, he calls us to be very attentive to our environment, not to let anything pass by as insignificant. A bit like a detective. You have to pay attention to everything, you know? You go to a crime scene, and oh, well, you know, there's nothing if there is like a piece of chewing gum on the floor, it matters, you know? If, you know, there's nothing insignificant. And that's how Freud wants us to look at the everyday. Okay, so I think we will maybe start by reading the footnote one more time. Uh, footnote three. Uh, and apologies for this text being so badly formatted. It's not easy to read. Uh, <coughs> but Can you read it like that? Okay, so could someone read to us this footnote three? Um, I will stop you a couple of times, but just, just to bring back the context. So Freud is saying about that, um, that in the very early days of the organism, and the organism here, it's both in terms of evolutionary it both in terms of the evolutionary development of the species and the individual development of the embryo. Yeah? Uh, so it's kind of both. 
in the early days of the organism, the only the, the operating principle is pleasure and pleasure, lust and lust. Yeah. So whatever is causing pleasure is making the organism desire this to continue, and whatever is causing displeasure or absence of pleasure or pain causes the organism, the organism to react in a different way. The first reaction to displeasure, for instance, it gets, it's, it's getting cold. Yeah? Once it's getting cold, the organism experiences unpleasure. At first, a pleasure, later, maybe pain. Yeah? Now, the first response of the organism is to imagine that it's warm, to deal with it via the imagination. And only once this attempt to fix the feeling by imagining a better state doesn't work, then the reality principle kicks in. And then the organism begins to develop various mechanisms to deal with the, the situation. Yeah? The reason it is important is because, as I, was, as I was telling you last week, we still have this very strong urge to be able to deal with the external environment simply by imagining a different situation. I think that also has something to do with the urge to be an artist. Because as an artist, you continuously imagine a different world when, with, when there are different relationships with materials, with things, between people. Yeah? Uh, as we saw in the George Clooney um, that, uh, um, that's, that's I think, what it's called, an uh, espresso. Uh, George Clooney espresso video. Uh, do we need to see it again? I think so, yeah? <laughs> oh, and we'll do everything for research. No? Uh, Clooney espresso video. Now, because I was thinking about it when we looked at it, I thought we did think about it hard enough. Uh, is this one? Yeah. Now, what I think we need, and what I want you to pay attention to is how, in what way, George Clooney's behavior in this clip is entirely consistent with the behavior of a newborn baby. Yeah. Throughout, his whole focus is only on pleasure. So he's surrounded with cars, beautiful women, and coffee. Yeah? Now it's very, it's interesting and it's very clever, obviously, and, um, and sadly, people who are working in marketing and advertising, they are the best readers of Freud. They really take on board what Freud is saying, and they know how to exploit it. But what, what, what I want you to pay attention to is, to what extent he's basically really like a baby. He has no he doesn't interfere at all with the environment, he's completely passive, and then this nice things keep happening to him. Yeah? Of course. And okay, so let, 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 let's watch it and see uh, now. Uh, sound? Sorry. <coughs> sound? Let's go to. Yeah. And the 
delicious aftertaste. He says, 
because of this desire to go back to the fully uh, to, to, to this complete experience of the pleasure principle where everything is happening according to your wish and imagination. Yeah? Uh, and that's, you know, I think you said it's a pretty good way of explaining it, otherwise it seems totally um, bizarre. No? No, maybe, maybe, maybe not for others. I always find such a strange thing. Um, Okay, so the, the reality principle develops in the organism because as a result of the pleasure principle failing uh, and imagination failing to produce desire. Now, those of you, those of us, I mean, or, or those people who uh, seek to improve their environment by, you know, putting on headphones, and listening to music, by switching on television in the evening, by putting themselves a glass of wine because they're stressed or because their work was terrible, uh, or you know, um, using whatever other um, drugs or mind-altering substances, all basically express the wish to return to this to this stage when wishing things makes them so, yeah? And so it is kind of an urge that Freud identifies as very basic in all of us. Um, and then he says, a new, but, but as imagining a better reality doesn't always work, then the, the organism starts to develop tools other tools to deal with the external reality. The first of them is paying attention to what is going on. The second is memory, where various experiences are getting stored. And then neuromotoric reactions. But all of this is happening in order to address the pains or the discomfort caused by the external environment. And for that reason, Freud is saying here, uh, a new principle of medical functioning was thus introduced. What was presented in the mind was no longer what was agreeable, but what was real, even if it happened to be disagreeable. This setting up of the reality principle proved to be a momentous step. So, it's because of the pain of the, it's because the environment causes pain that for the first time the organism admits into it, admits into its mental functioning something that is no longer agreeable. Something that is not agreeable but real. Yeah? Does it make sense? So, George Clooney, as you could see in this video, he doesn't let anything disagreeable enter his world. You know? He thinks that the woman wants his autograph because everybody thinks that everybody is in love with him. So the woman says, no, I just want coffee. And that causes a shock because he thinks that she just wants to express her love to him. Yeah? The other woman also thinks she wants to, you know, kiss him or something, but she just wants him to park her car. Yeah? Um, so he is unable to allow reality to enter his world. He only is capable of letting pleasure enter. That's why it's funny, because we know that we cannot operate like this. We know that we must allow unpleasant experiences or the reality principle to enter our consciousness as well. But George, George Clooney exemplifies a state of mind when nothing real can enter. You know, or like the previous one we saw, that you, Nico, said, what a of rubbish. But what is going on there? That is women sitting there and saying, oh, he's so strong and so aromatic and it <laughs> so good. And again, Clooney thinks that it's, it is all about him because, because he operates purely on the pleasure principle. Yeah? And the joke, of 
Gospel is that we can see that he is wrong, that they are not talking about him, they talk about the coffin. But of course, the joke is actually not on George Clooney, but on us. Because we watch this, and then we go and buy the espresso. Because we identify with Clooney's desire to live in a pleasure principle universe. So what would Freud do if he looks at this? Uh, at the <laughs> well, he, he, he would say, I think he would say what I'm saying, that, that while on the face of it, we are smarter than Clooney because we see how naive he is to think that it's all about him, actually, we are the target of this ad advertisement, and we, we are its victims, and the joke is on us, because ultimately, we feel this endless desire to go back to the state of the pleasure principle, and that's why you will go and be by espresso. But Freud knows this two yeah. principles, so he might not buy the... Oh, well, you also might not buy it. Um, I don't think Freud never saw, never saw himself as in any way different. Uh, he, also said, he also analyzed himself, and it's fascinating and his own dreams, and his relationship with his father. The point is that, of course, if you understand the mechanism of this advertisement, like we do now, it does make you a little bit more, uh, let's say, sophisticated, and you perhaps can have some way to protect yourself from it. But it's almost a lost battle. Advertising is so sophisticated, and it really knows how to trigger all our points of insecurity and desire. That's why something like Nespresso makes terrible tipping coffee is so successful. Yeah, I don't know if you if you it's right. Like it. It's terrible. But it's uh, so why is it such a popular brand? Somehow it does feel this um, hole. <laughs> we have inside ourselves, this, this desire to go back. We want to be in a state of, to be enveloped with pleasure, just like Clooney. I'm just saying, while we laugh at George Clooney's naivety, it's actually us who are naive, because we clearly are buying into this. Yeah? So, Freud is also, Freud wrote quite a few books about sociology and about social behaviors. The most famous of them is uh, called Society and its Discontents. He wrote it after the second book. I, he, no, sorry. Sorry. Civilization and its Discontents. He wrote it after the, the First World War, trying to understand why young people from Germany, England, Japan, USA, so happily slaughtered each other for five years, killing about 20 million people in the process. Uh, and he applies very similar analysis that we read about now to society. And he says, well, society itself suffers from a neurosis. Society is neurotic. And in a sense, his view of society is deeply uh, pessimistic. But we're not going to get too much into that. We just need, this is a, a this is a very interesting read because there is a contrast here between what society deems as necessary for its survival and what the individual person needs for their happiness. And Freud says that these two things cannot be reconciled. What you need for your happiness and what the society needs are at odds with each other. Um, we might come back to this one day by popular demand. Also, I think next year, we need to talk about it later, but um, next year it will be good to think of a way to continue these seminars. So, uh, because I think you're going to be working on your research paper and it might be just helpful 
Um, but that, that's, that's, that's something we need to talk about later. Okay, so let's go to the, to the footnote and read it again. So, uh, it feels like reading, or I will try to simplify and just call the follow up. Thank you very much. I will try to simplify the above schematic account to see further details. It will be rightly objected that an organization which was a slave to the pleasure principle and neglected the reality of the external world could not maintain itself alive for the shortest time so that it could not come into existence at all. So, so, sorry, uh, let me stop here for a second. Do you see what he says here? It says that it's possible to object, many people will object, that an organism that is based purely on the pleasure principle is a fiction. It cannot exist. The employment of a fiction like this is, however, justified if one considers that the infant, provided one includes it with the care of the of its mother, does almost realize that a psychical system is kind. It probably hallucinates the fulfillment of its internal needs. It betrays its own pleasure when there is an increase of stimulus and an absence of satisfaction by the motor discharge of screaming and beating about its arms and legs, and it then experiences the satisfaction as hallucinated. Later, as an older child, it learns to employ these manifestations of discharge intentionally as methods of expressing its feelings. Since the late care of children is modeled on the care of infants, the dominance of the pleasure principle can really come to an end only when the child has achieved complete physical no, psychical. Uh, psychical, sorry, detachment from its parents. So what do you think psychical detachment from the parents means? <coughs> and did, is anyone here who already achieved that? Raise your hand. <laughs> it's difficult, huh? What is a psychical detachment from your parents? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. And yet Freud says it's kind of essential. Yeah? But that's the what Freud says in civilization is his discontents about the the contradicted the desires of the individual society also apply to the individual and the family. The individual wants to be an artist. The family says, you will do no such thing. Because God, no one in our family was an artist until now, and we need you here to look after the grandmother or after the mother, and to, you know, help with the garden or whatever, um, or with the business or the factory or the shop. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So, uh, well, can you continue? A neat example of the psychical system shut off. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, where are we? Uh, it probably hallucinates. Uh, can you go from here? Can you start from later as an older child? Later, as an older child, it learns its arms and legs. Uh, later, as an older child, it learns to employ these manifestations of discharge intentionally as methods of expressing its feelings. Since the later care of children is modeled in the care of infants, the dominance of the pleasure principle can really come to an end only when the child has achieved complete psychical detachment from its parents. A neat example of a psychical system shut off from the stimuli of the external world and able to satisfy its nutritional requirements artistically to use the food of the is afforded by a bird's egg with its food supply closed in its shell. For it, the care provided by its mother is limited to the provision of warmth. I shall not regard it as a correction, but as an application of the schematic picture and the discussion. If it is insisted that a system living according to the pleasure principle must have devices to enable it to withdraw from the stimuli of reality, such devices are merely the correct correlative repression which treats internal and pleasurable stimuli as if they are external, that is to say, pushes them into the external world. So, thank you. Uh, anyone have any thoughts about that? What do you think? There's a lot here. Huh? I feel like to me that in the early sense that you could ever achieve something like that in your parents' no. behavior service. Right? No. It's yeah. not. It's not. Yeah. You cannot. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, how if you 
had like a stressful or traumatic event or any encounter with someone or something which causes um, you anxiety, it's more often that you think about that experience in the time and place it happened, and so you externalise it and it replays in your head as a hallucination as opposed to internalising it and concerns it and letting it go. And that maybe when you do that, then you cease to hallucinate so much anymore. So, I think we read about uh, consciousness. So, what is consciousness? Uh, can we, we we now on the next page? So, let's just look at this. Uh, the increased significance of external reality. Are we? Yeah. The increased significance of external reality heightened the importance to of the sense organs that are directed towards the external world and of consciousness attached to them. So, what do you think Freud means by consciousness? Since it well, sense organs, so okay, let's take a step back. So, the organism that we discussed, that first wanted to solve all its problems by imagining a better situation, realized that imagination is not sufficient to deal with its problems, because the external world kept rushing in, despite imagining or shutting it, imagining to shut it, shutting it down. So, in response to this continued assault from the outside, the organism develops sense organs to deal with the external world. Sense organs are the senses of touch, smell, uh, taste, this kind of thing. They tell you when something is unpleasant, hot, cold, salty, this one, yeah, sharp. So these are the senses. Now, the senses need a management system. And this management system is consciousness. So consciousness is, in a sense, the internal dimension of the senses. When I put my hand in the fire and my hand gets Burn. Yeah? This is the sense organ and consciousness working together to catalog this experience. So in the future, I see fire, I don't even need to put my hand. Otherwise, we would all the time do the same thing. Yeah? So this is quite interesting because Freud develops a theory of the organism drawn out of pleasure, displeasure. That's the, that's the basic question he is asking. Yeah? So, uh, then the next sentence. Consciousness now learned to comprehend sensory qualities in addition to the qualities of pleasure and unpleasure, which had Heimato had alone been of interest to. So, um, and a special function was instituted which had periodically to search the external world in order that its data might be familiar already if an urgent internal need should arise. The function of attention. So attention is like a scanner, like a, yeah, it's a kind of scanner that you use to scan your environment to see if there is something there you need to know about in order to avoid unpleasure. Okay. Uh, 
So, in the next paragraph, we encounter this word that Zach mentioned, the taxes. So, do you know what it is? Um, I was under the impression that if this uh, kind of obsessive uh, compulsion is the word that An urge. An urge. Yes, that's right, that's right, yes. Yes. Uh, he uses this word a few times, and I don't think it necessarily needed in order to make sense of the text, but Zach is right, it is, it is an urge. So, could someone read this thing here? The place of impression which excluded <coughs> from... Uh, this word, I guess it, I can't it's catexis, catexis. Catexis. As productive of, um, as a productive of unpleasure, some of the emerging ideas was taken by the partial parts of the judgment, which had to decide whether a given idea was true or false. That is, whether it was in agreement with reality or not. The decision being determined by making a comparison with the memory reality. Okay, good. So, <laughs> what what do you make of this? What is okay? Based on what you read here, what is truth? The impartial passing of judgment, which has to decide whether a given idea was true or false, that is, whether it was in agreement with reality or not. So I'm asking you, what does it mean when we say that something is true, according to Freud? That it agrees with reality. Yeah? So the notion of truth is purely the domain of the reality principle. In the pleasure principle world, there is no truth. There's only pleasure. Yeah? And that's important to bear in mind that psychically, truth is only valid within the reality principle. Yeah? Now, if art is to do with the pleasure principle, then in art there is no truth. There is a completely different principle operating in art. Not, so we don't ask of art whether it's true or not. We ask whether it gives pleasure or not. Uh, What, what advertising does and the whole 
commodities in general, they all appeal to, they, they never appeal to some kind of rational logic. They always appeal to pleasure, you know? That's, you know, the, the most classic example is that, you know, there would be like an advertisement for a washing machine with a beautiful woman standing next to it. You know, why? What, what that has to do with washing clothes, no? Because it is about pleasure, sexual pleasure. So because you associate the sexual pleasure with a beautiful woman, you transfer it to the washing machine. You buy the washing machine and you didn't get any pleasure. In fact, in a sense, you lost a lot of pleasure because you gave your money away. That's just a bit questionable because essentially those who use washing machines are usually not men. Hmm. So well, I'm not saying that only yeah, men are attracted to women. There's only a question of, again, to me it looks more like there are targeted groups. It doesn't apply to everybody, so that's why there is a reason why someone will buy that washing machine and someone will prefer a different brand. Because the identity that they will deliver to you will be actually targeted towards you, towards your needs. Well, I, 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 I ask you, I set you a task. Uh, when you watch commercial television next, and you watch some advertisements, just see in what way they appeal to the pleasure principle. And you will see that all of them, without fail, always appeal to the pleasure principle. When you, uh, when you watch, let's say, advertisements for the lottery, they don't say, oh, well, you know, it's scientifically proven that you have one in hundred million chance of winning a bit of big prize. No, because that would not be about pleasure. They say, oh, it would be so great and you will buy your mother a cruise and whatever, you know? So, just watch it. By the way, anyone managed to see uh, the Wicker Man? Yeah. A little, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's... So, yeah, I was watching last night, so I got a question, I couldn't remember why, or is there a reason you just watching it? Why? Well, I thought it is quite interesting in terms of um, the pleasure principle. Did you say so? Which one? Did you watch the old one? Yeah, the second and third. Yeah, and what did you think? Um, I mean, it's an interesting twist at the end. Uh, I need, you know, like I was saying about throwing books at the wall, if you don't really enjoy them, I need to switch it off. Sorry, sorry? I need to switch it off um, about 15, 20 minutes in. It's been quite a bit of it. It's interesting. Um, I think it's... To me, it came across like quite, quite kind of dated, like uh, kind of 60s hippies, early 70s hippies, kind of ideals of what um, like kind of paganism is or could be or alternative to... Um, but uh, what, is, what is interesting, I think, is how it operates around repressed sexuality. How repressed sexuality becomes aggression. And in a sense, it's a very astute political comment about what happens when people are repressed. Now, in this very repressed society, there is this urge to do something incredibly explosive, precisely because you may not act your desire in the open, in the everyday. You all the time have to sort of, sort of, children need to sit like this in school, and every garden has to be really neat and tidy, and every door, porch has to be carefully painted, and everyone is behaving in the kind of Calvinist, uh, Lutheran, Christian way, you know? And, and what it causes is this explosive explosion of uh, well, paganism, but it's basically like all this suppressed uh, pleasure comes out in this murderous final sacrificial sin. Yeah? And that also, I think, explains how fascism happens. Fascism, fascism happens, according to Freud, through sexual repression. First, you don't let people express their uh, sexual desires. You don't let people have any pleasure principle. And then you tell you give them one avenue through which this pleasure can come out. You say, look, 
you can do whatever you like to the Jews or to the homosexuals or whatever. And that's how uh, the, all this energy gets, gets channeled uh, and becomes a political force. Uh, so you can see it also in Trump rallies. Because where, that, where he holds these rallies often in the most Puritan, religiously conservative areas where people go to church, when there's no like raids or parties, you know, um, when everything is very family oriented, very sort of patriarchal. And in these environments, people go completely crazy when they're given the chance. Because Trump is exactly like Clooney, he embodies this baby experience of just living in the world better. He has a, a gold toilet, yeah? Which is very interesting, again, from the Freudian sense, in terms of the able trauma, yeah? So, uh, so uh, he becomes the embodiment of everyone's pleasure. I don't know if that helps to understand why I asked you uh, to watch this. Uh, anyone had a chance to see the Singing Detective? which is a bit bigger undertaking. It's three DVDs. And, I mean, what Ken said about the Rick Wickerman also applies to the thing that it's probably the greatest TV program, uh, one of the greatest ones, probably just as fantastic as Twin Peaks by David Lynch, and inspiring David Lynch. Uh, but it takes, it takes a while to get into because television is, looks dated very quickly and the program from the 70s or 80s is not as sleek as what we used to from Netflix. But if you get into it, it has some fantastic uh, scenes about, it's probably the best description of psychoanalysis on film um, ever made. I like that. Philip Marlowe. Yeah. And, and uh, she keeps asking for more money and not really saying any words at all. And then uh, there's this like, big build up and she keeps the money that she's given, which is like about six million pounds. And then there's this, it, it takes a long time to put up this scene, but then the actual sex scene is like completely short, it just looks like very, very, very boring sex, and they both are not enjoying it. And he even hit so, I mean, it was like, yeah, interesting how a lot of it was uh, about that, like, uh, desire. And, and it's good, though. Isn't it the yeah, case? It honestly felt like it was literally written out of the like, textbook. You had the suicide of the mother and, like, the child and the thing. But then the thing that I thought was interesting about, too, is this, that, the, the, I uh, don't know how to say it. Sorry, psoriasis. Or uh, uh, the skin condition. Yeah, yeah. Is that? Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the condition of the skin. The never ending pain of not yeah. being able to get away from just true or comfort at every breathing second. And the, uh, the it craving to create the uh, escape. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like everything was in the Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I said it's. it's if you, if you get into it, you get a lot out of this, of this uh, program um, in relation to Freud. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit because I want to... Uh, let me see, uh, break? Want to break? Okay. Yeah. Um, so 10 minutes, can you come back at quarter past? Innocent, you know, because um, 
because no, not my children. <laughs> well, uh, good. And <laughs> I guess you can't do that unless you are like actually a parent, like because you just you just see it, it's a side perspective. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's always hilarious, obviously, because it's one of the things he says about kids are really apt, and then other things are just super so it's like, come on, it could go both ways, obviously. Yeah, well, I think, yeah. yes, yes. I, I think he's not a graphic designer, but he works on the, uh, 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 like, there's another one, uh, another, uh, uh, physical angle, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally it's different. So, well, not totally. Um, Jung, Jung and Freud were very, very close for a long were, time. Were they friends? Huh? Were they like lovers? They were, yeah, they were and very close. They and, 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 and then they separated. And they separated because they disagreed on, yeah. on some principles. Yeah. But they still very close. Jung and analysis and Freud and analysis are. So I think yeah. people just approach to uh, one thing from their own uh, perceptions. So we uh, we can uh, understand it or um, we can per perceive it from our own angle. So it's like reflections or reflections or something like well, that. Well, the thing is that Freud often talks about people who object to his theories. He anticipates these objections. And he says it is really interesting that uh, those people who are most object to his theories about children are those who are the most strict in raising the child and actually create the biggest trauma in the child. Uh, so, Freud, and what I find is interesting is until today, 100 years since he wrote these things, Freud still touches a raw nerve. People just often don't like to hear what he has to say. And when, we, when, when people come out and say, oh, he's wrong, there are better theories, what Freud would say to that is that you simply cannot handle this way of thinking. Yes? What do people mean when they say children are innocent? Sorry? What do they mean when they say children are innocent? Well, ask them. I'm not saying that. I mean, innocent kind of just carries like a. I will give you, uh, okay, I'll, I'll let, let me tell you about it. So Freud's theory of childhood is that in the early stages of the child's development, the child is polymorphously perverse. Let me spell yeah. it for you. Okay, polymorph, I hope it's, it's correct? No. Polymorphously perverse. Now, I think it's with a, it's a Y, yeah? So, what is perverse? What does it mean to be perverse? What, what is a pervert? Well, right. the child, basically Freud says, the child is a pervert. A pervert is someone who derives sexual pleasure in, well, perverse ways, in non-traditional not standard ways. Uh, so perverse pleasure is pleasure that is not connected to recreation. Yeah, does it make sense? No. Uh, polymorphous, poly means all, yeah? Like poly, I don't know. Poly, poly means many. And uh, Polymorphous means that the whole body of the baby, all the body, is, is a sexual organ. Not just the penis or the vagina or the nipples, but all the whole body of the, of the baby is a zone of pleasure. Now, when we talk about adult anatomy, we say that, you know, there are erogenous zones in the body. You know this expression, right? The genitals are an erogenous zone, the mouth, it's these parts of the body that give, that, that are capable of giving pleasure. But not, for instance, I don't know, the elbow or something like that. But 
that for the child, all parts of the body are pleasure. Yeah? So the child doesn't have a sense of the genitals being somehow privileged in terms of pleasure in relation to the rest of the body. The whole body is just a, a, a organ or a, a, a vehicle for pleasure. So and for that reason, the child is perverse because it derives sexual pleasure not from sexual organs, but from any activity like sucking the thumb. For Freud, sucking the thumb is a, is a sexual activity of the child. Defecating, going on the toilet, is a sexual activity. It gives pleasure. So, so for Freud, the whole first three years of child's life are all to do with just continuous seeking of sexual pleasure until this behavior is gradually banned by the parents because the child is told how to behave. The reality principle kicks in and the child needs to learn how to behave in ways which are socially acceptable and all these ways drive pleasure out. Now, we maybe want to ask why we construct a society based around excluding pleasure? Well, there are many, or so we can go and sell them espresso capsules. Yeah, for instance. But um, but I'm not saying that we need to say, answer this question now, but it's interesting. Couldn't we construct a different society? Couldn't we imagine a different society which is based on pleasure principles? And I want to suggest that going to an art gallery is often about leaving the world of reality and entering the world of pleasure. It can be unpleasant. But what is interesting about the space of the gallery, the white cube, or what you create here on a Monday, when the install works, when we enter this space, we enter a space based on the pleasure principle and not on the reality principle. Successful install is all about that. Yes. So does, does that mean the unconscious uh, is the repressed pleasure? Yes, not the repressed. The unconscious is all about the pleasure. Oh. The, the unconscious is repressed because we know that if we act on our unconscious urges, we will be socially excluded. Now, here is a little example of what, what Freud says about children that makes many people very angry with me. Uh, so he talks about how, how uh, boys around the age of, let's say, 11, 12, 13, start to feel really, really sick and often vomit when they are in the car, in the bus, in the train. You remember? Uh, maybe not only boys, I don't know, but he speaks about boys in this case. And he says, well, what happens is that when the boy was little, two, two year old, three year old, uh, riding in this bumpy train was a sexual experience. It was a form of masturbation. It gave sexual pleasure because of all these vibrations, of this jumping up and down, it gave sexual pleasure. But as the boy grew up and he was told that Masturbation is a big sin and not allowed, and touching yourself for pleasure is generally forbidden. Yeah? Um, and um, now, when the boy is on the train and he experiences a similar sensation, it makes him vomit because he was told how disgusting this behavior is. So, do you see how he constructs it? Not everyone likes it. But I think it's quite profound observation. It's very smart, at the very least. Yeah? And it really gets to grips with, well, how we sit here in this room? Look at where your hands are. You hold your head, which is kind of upset in society. But no one here 
at least as far as I can see. No one has a, a head in their trousers <laughs> touching their genitals. Why not? Why not masturbate a little while, while, while you are in the center? Just so you can have a lot of like, teenagers do walk around doing that. Like, well, of course they do! <laughs> Only teenagers? Are you serious? But like on the streets, you know, kind of yeah. like, that kind of behavior. Yeah, of course, of course they do. Yeah, but, but so, so why we create a society that makes it such a big deal? What's, what would what be so bad? about giving yourself a bit of pleasure while, you know, you're sitting in a three-hour cinema. No, no, no one's going to get particularly hurt, yeah? It's not going to take, no one's going to be poorer. So why is it such a bad thing? Sorry? Well, actually, you make it make people concentrate better. Maybe. <laughs> maybe you will enjoy it more. I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting, isn't it? We could imagine a different society in which it wouldn't be such a big deal. But what I want to say, one second, uh, is that for a child, for a, for the child between the age of zero to three year old, before they absorb these social rules, the animals, all they do is continuously giving themselves pleasure in whatever way they can. Which okay. means they're actually innocent until. Sorry? Which means they're more innocent when they don't know. Well, you know, it, because no. Freud is a doctor. He's really not interested in innocent or. It's, it's the parents who are worried about indecent behavior. It's the parents. Did you see this film by uh, Haneke and the White Ribbon? It's a film about Austria. It's a little bit similar to the weaker man in its idea, but it's a film about a very strict upbringing um, in an austere family um, um, by this great direct, direct, director, Haneke. Did you see? No? Do you know Haneke? Repression is like his bread and butter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In a big way. Um, yeah, the other picture is one. But yeah, but, uh, but this is the uh, the White Ribbon by Michael Haneke. Um, so in this film, uh, it's a it's a kind of a family of a priest in uh, Austria. The yeah, the boy in the film is about twelve. The parents caught him or they suspect that he is masturbating at night. So he needs to sleep with his hands tied to the sides of the bed. So he will not touch himself. So imagine he's to lie in the bed with his hands tied to the sides. Yeah? That's the idea of being in this. Now, murders start to happen in this village. People start to get killed, visitors, you know? And gradually we realize that it is the children who do all this killing. And again, it is that's what happens as a result of sexual repression. If you because if you don't repress people at all, then you don't have any society. Yeah? Everyone is just sort of all the time just scratching themselves and masturbating and you know, not doing any, any productive work. Society cannot function. But if you repress people too much, you end up with a very murderous, fascist society. Mm -hmm. Where the only allowed pleasure is to kill someone. Yeah? See what happened in Germany when suddenly it was permitted to do whatever you want to the Jews. Normal everyday people, not like members of the Nazi party or the SS, normal everyday people went on the streets and broke the shop windows of the, the, the they were owned by the Jews. Why? There was pleasure. There was a enjoyment. So and also the loss of serial killers also they have this uh, well, yeah, obviously, yes, yes. So if you look at, for instance, uh, Hannibal Lester, what it's called, uh, the Silence of the Lambs film, it's based on exactly the same thing, and they also make him a, a psychiatrist to bring it home. So were there any other questions? Did you want to say something? Uh, it's not really a question, it's just kind of like, I guess, contemplation about going back into the question of how 
society would be if it was just about sexual pleasure. Because sometimes I feel like there, not every pleasure can be just sexual pleasure. Like it's quite a distinguishable kind of pleasure. So I understand where it comes from and like it is kind of general yeah. feeling of it. But it's still it's quite a specific pleasure and I can't imagine to avoid it just called that pleasure because it is like it's it's tiring pleasure. Well for Freud, the first experience of pleasure is sexual and all subsequent pleasures are different sublimations of that. That's Freud. Now, okay, yeah, you know, not everyone agrees and many people would, would be disagree. And I'm not telling you, you know, you have to become Freudians from now on. We just want to understand what Freud says and then you do with it what you want. Yes. Yeah, I want to go back to this unconscious again. On? Unconscious. Yes. Yeah. So I also think that unconscious is driven by the future. By? By future. Future. Yeah. What do you want to do in future in our own country? No, well, there, no for, well, not, not according to Freud. I mean, what it is. And it doesn't really. Well, that's what Freud thinks, anyway. Because the unconscious doesn't have any sense of future or past. The unconscious only has the present moment in which it wants to have pleasure. Because it is not permitted, that has to be suppressed. And where it comes out is in dreams. Dreams, because, in the, because at night you lie in the bed, horizontally, generally on your own, or almost alone, uh, excluded from society, uh, there is less risk for the, uh, these unconscious urges to come out. So they come out in the shape of dreams. And, and dreams are modified unconscious urges that come out in form they basically come into the conscious, but in the form that we can, that the conscious can accept. For that reason, read Freud's wonderful book, The Interpretation of Dreams, uh, where the, the, the book is life changing. It's complete mind uh, eye opener. Uh, any other questions? So we continue. Is it, is it interesting for you this, this this way of discussing? I mean, we really move quite slowly, but there is so much to discuss, There's so much coming up just for reading a few lines. Yes. Well, go ahead. Uh, it's again related to unconscious, though. Yes. Uh, so, <coughs> Freud said that unconscious is the repressed desire. Yes. Tired, right? So I think it, it not only depends on the individual person, but also my unconscious is driven by the Ancestors? Yes. What? That's young What? That's young Oh. Yeah, my unconscious is not only uh, <coughs> dependent on me and my childhood, but also from the, the, the long life. In what way? I, I can understand what he's saying, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, but okay. I, I can get get the sense. Uh, so the unconscious is not purely about pleasure. The yeah. unconscious is about something huge. He's, he talks about the future. I think it, it's maybe related to faith or something. It's not religious, but your faith or what? Not for Freud. Not for Freud. So Freud is... Uh, is, is oh. <laughs> well, it's interesting how what we hear around the table is how often people want to somehow say, oh, Let's not pay attention to what Freud says. Now, maybe, maybe it's because it's not that convenient for us to accept mm -hmm. what Freud is saying. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I, I mean, there's the the question of whether you like like or like identify with the end like deprogramming of, of our consciousness. Yes. I think it seems like why I have no children is because there's no clear, uh, like, successful path out of it. it. It breaks you down when you look at this, this issue, and you can clearly see the reality of it, but if you don't, if it leaves you completely like, abandoned in there, then you have all the places of, like, all of those grandchildren killing themselves and stuff like that. Well, uh, okay, so you basically say, let's not find out about the truth because it is too hard to bear. 
Well, if you, so, okay, it, it is the, the pushing factor of even our evolutionary process. You, if you're going to deconstruct the society, okay, so, so if, um, like an aesthetic, like a control of your urges is how we collectively successfully interact together. The only way we can all do this is by choosing not to scratch and touch ourselves or something like that. Or so, or so we, we think. Yeah. But if you're going to say, well, why would you not do that? Then you're opening up something to where there's no, you, you have to be able to say, so you should be able to scratch and touch yourself. But here's how we will all respond to this successfully. And there's no like there's no path into like a healthy world where we all masturbate publicly. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think one path is art. Um, another, well, the question is not whether there is a path or not, because Freud didn't really he's not a social engineer. He's a doctor who tries to understand pathological behaviors. He's trying to explain why it is patients who come to him with deep problems to which there are no medical solutions. Yeah? And he tries to help his clients, his, his patients. Yeah. And the method he developed is psychoanalysis. Yeah, because he, he approached this uh, problem with uh, logical thinking. Yeah. So there's uh, some binary inside of it. Like, it's like the science. Uh, we cannot say it's wrong, but it cannot provide us a solution for the uh, well, he does, he does offer a solution. The solution is psychoanalysis. Because he says in psychoanalysis. I, I, I kind of like a that sense of like, it's just like you're constantly, okay, you're better around. It, it's like you bump into the same thing, so you're like trying to explain something to yourself about yourself, and you're like, well, according to Freud, it's going to be about a dick, for example. It's going to be about a giant. Like, it's like, it doesn't, it just, why am I even trying to justify this? It doesn't mean that I'm understanding anyways because everything is about well, sense. Look, look, guys, let's just bring it. And I'm not saying I'm going to create a case. So let's the next, yeah, yeah, the yeah, next, yeah. the next text we're going to read after this. I'm not going to don't tell you what we're going to do. But the next text is a book that's called Anti Oedipus, and that's by Deleuze and Guattari, and that is to a large extent criticism of Freud. Yeah. So, but but before we get to that, we can understand what Freud is about. Now, I'm not trying to convince any one of you to become Freudian. Just like I was never trying to convince anyone to become a Marxist or a Platonist. That's just, exactly what I'm saying. Like I don't disagree with it. It's just more like I'm trying to. Like, but in all, in you, what I want you to do is at least for the duration of the seminar is to look at the world through Freud's eyes. Mm. You know, and then you do with it what you like. So, Freud would say what you are doing now, in psychotherapeutic terms, is called resistance. Yeah? Is, um... I, I, I don't know. I'm not resisting. I'm not resisting. <laughs> this is... <laughs> it's, it's more so seeing how it has a causal effect yeah. on the majority. Yeah. And so it's more on the majority. What about the your, your system has seemingly your your deprogramming yeah. this like social structure that's causing all yeah. of this psychosomatic. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. But by deprogramming it, it's having a deeper causal problem in society, and and and, and that's just it's more just a question of like of its. Uh, so you basically say, Freud, yeah. why did you why are you waking up the monsters? Let the monsters lie. But if the, if, if, if the, the goal is to fix a psychosomatic issue, why would you say, if you really want to heal your, you know, your, um, your inability to yeah. move your right yeah. arm, you should kill yourself? No. Is, is, is kind of a, a bad but, but that's not what Freud is saying. He's <laughs> saying, if you want to heal your paralyzed right arm, you need to understand what caused the pain. And what caused the pain is the realization that your father went to a prostitute. And it was, there was an article about it in the newspaper. Uh, now, there's so much more to say about 
Freud's discoveries. Because one of the things, for instance, he started to hear from his patients, from his clients, is how many people speak about being sexually abused by their parents. In the, in not like one case or two cases, which you can only explain as sort of, you know, some kind of monstrosity, but scores of them, loads of patients under in psychoanalysis start to report in Vienna, in this polite Viennese society where men wear big hats and women wear dresses, you know, and everything is very proper. It is fun, a report being abused by their, many, many women report being abused by their parents, by their father mostly, as children. Boys also report being abused by women, but mostly women report being abused by parents. And it's very interesting because at first, Freud was a very honest uh, physician and he reported, even though I put his career in, in, in peril, because you know, it was just as it sounds outrageous today, imagine how outrageous it sounded hundred years ago. To say that, well, it's quite common for parents to sexually abuse their children. Uh, but it, get, it got more complicated and even more kind of scary. Later on, he, saw, he realized that actually it's not that parents generally abuse their daughters. It's the daughters fantasize about having sex with their, parents, with their fathers. They desire it. That's what they want. And they imagine it and they fantasize it and they talk about it as if it happened. But it, quite often it didn't happen. Quite often something else happened. And the, um, Freud has this wonderful essay, which we used to read here as well. It's called, A Child is Being Beaten. And it is in, um, in our Dropbox, in the Freud Dropbox, uh, here. A Child is Being Beaten. And um, you can read it. It is about uh, sadomasochistic fantasies in little girls. Very interesting. Go ahead with that. Um, so, um, going back to uh, the text, I want to read the suppression of the pleasure principle. Will somebody read this section? This is the section of the. I don't have a cure. Sorry? Sorry, I don't have a cure. I cannot see clearly. You cannot see. Uh, okay, you can come closer if you want. There's no problem. Uh, the suppression of the, of the pleasure principle by uh, the reality principle with all the uh, psychical uh, consequences involved which is here, uh, in the like, like <coughs> uh, condensed into a single sentence is not in fact accomplishment all at once, nor does it take place simultaneously all along the line. For while this development uh, <coughs> is going on in the ego instincts, the sexual instincts become uh, detached from the, in a very significant way. The sexual instincts is very powerful and involved people at first. Thank you. Let me just stop here for a second. What is autoerotic? What does it mean to say sexual instincts behave autoerotically at first? We spoke about I spoke about it. <coughs> what, how do you understand that? The whole body is genital without knowing that it's genital and it's just genital. The whole, the, whole, the whole body is genital. And what is, what is autoeroticism? Just so we are clear about that. The body. What is auto? Self. 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 Yeah. Automobile. Self moving. <coughs> Autonomous. Self governing. Yeah. Autoerotic. <coughs> arousing being sexually aroused by yourself. Yes? 
deriving sexual pleasure from your own body. This, for Freud, is the origin of the sexual drive. So, you know, the church is teaching a kind of the, the general consensus is the sexual drive is connected to procreation. We need to have children, therefore, the act of making babies is pleasurable. No, for Freud, no. For Freud, the origin of the sexual drive is your own body. Yeah? The pleasure, the origin of the sexual pleasure is with yourself. Yeah? Um, as Woody Allen said, he said, uh, don't knock off masturbation because it's sex to someone you love. Sorry? The scientific way it's said is uh, the erection of penis has not been the so called from spring, it's just natural. Okay. It's also so called Okay, well, what natural means here is, a, is an interesting question. But uh, now, can you continue? They obtain the satisfaction. Uh, they obtain the satisfaction in the subject's own body and therefore do not find themselves in the situations of frustration which was that. Uh, necessitated the instinction of the reality principle. And when later on, the process of finding an object to this is soon interpreted and interrupted by a long period of latency, which uh, delays sexual development and pure puberty. Okay, stop here. I think it's enough. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation. In, yeah, yeah. In Freud's theory of, of um, infant sexuality, he says human sexual development is very different from sexual development in other animals because it kind of happens twice in humans for reasons we don't need to explain in the moment. But the first sexual moment is from age zero to six years when it's mostly autoerotic, the body of the infant itself is a source of sexual excitement and pleasure. And then what happens, then the children are basically told by the parents and society in general that anything to do with sexual pleasure is really bad. Keep your hands where I can see them. Take your hands out of your trousers and all these kind of things, you know. Don't eat with the open mouth. Don't suck your tongue. Sit, stand straight. Don't slouch. All these kind of things. You know, don't cry. You know, boys don't cry. And all these rules around how not to give in to the pleasure principle. That continues until the age of puberty, which is around, what, 12, roughly, 11, 12, 9, 12, 11, in boys and girls become a slightly different age, when the genitals begin to uh, develop. And when, then the next, the second phase of uh, sexual development occurs, and at that point, the child starts to look for other objects. For, for sexual pleasure. Yeah? So between the age of three to the age of nine, there is a kind of like a vacuum. Um, that is caused by social norms coming in and forbidding the child from engaging in anything pleasurable. Yes. In Freud, is there any examples of like, any positive responses to this, like forbidden sexual repression? Like, I don't know. Is it anything whatsoever is this like really bad repressed issue? Like um, going back to the public yeah. masturbation. Yeah. There, could you say that <clears throat> repressing your autoerotic yeah. response is black and white, but there's a certain, like we're like, we're being like, this is, this is like one thing. And then, I guess what I'm saying is, sorry, I'm not saying it wrong. Is there a certain amount of healthy repression? Like, yes, yes, no, I think I, I think I said it before. There is a certain amount of healthy repression. That's the thing, if you don't repress your Eid at all, civilization would be impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because in order to function socially, we need certain amount of repression. So that actually was very clear to people already in the Enlightenment that 
it's kind of your urges are sort of it's like a horse. You know that a wild horse. Now if you want to ride a horse, you need to take it. Yeah? But there is this expression, you tame a horse once, you ride it. No, no, no. You break a horse once, you tame it. You break a horse twice, you kill it. So if you break a horse once from a wild animal, you get a house animal and you can work with it. But if you repress it too much, if you really break its spirit, you end up with a dead horse. Yeah? So some repression is necessary. But too much repression, that's, what, that, that's when you get the weaker man. That's when you get Trump problems. That's when you get the Christenacht um, in Germany. The, 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 the Christenacht. Um, and, you, and, and so... There's a good film, it's a cartoon called Spirit, based on that. And he breaks the horse too much. And who, what is the cartoon? It's called Spirit. Spirit. It's really good. It's, really, really it's a Japanese anime. It is, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. Uh, so, yes, to answer the question, some repression is necessary, but when there is too much repression, uh, society slides into fascism. Is it all kinds of questions why you want to write the whole thing? Why do you think you need to, to even go in that direction? Well, I, mean, I, I only brought the horse here as a, as well, a metaphor. In, in, in the metaphorical sense. Yeah. In the metaphorical yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And oh. it, 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 of, of course it does. But it's, it's almost like asking why do, we need, why, why do we need culture in the first place? Yeah. yeah? Um, no. To the extent that we need society in order to thrive, uh, we need to repress some of our urges in order to work collectively. Because my urge might be to take a drink of coffee and drink it, because I want some coffee, so my urge doesn't know that it's someone else's. I just take it, yeah? Because that's my urge. I just take what I want. Well, like what George Clooney does, you know? He just, he just goes for it, because that, that's what he wants, you know? But because I need to repress some of these urges in order to be able to function with you guys in kind of so-called polite society. But if these urges are repressed too much, then you end up with something like the White Raven, the Hanukkah film, when children go out and kill strangers, or you end up with the Wicker Man, when they do these sort of murderous rituals. Yeah? So that's how it works, the repression. Yeah? At least it's a good thing. And again, what do you think is happening? Well, what is so interesting about art in the Freudian way of thinking about it is that art is a place where the levels of repression can be renegotiated. Mm. Yeah? So for instance, the install on Monday. Um, now, what um, Shu did, the sleeping performance, was a kind of uh, renegotiating of the pleasure principle, reality principle boundaries, we generally know that there is, a, there is a social norm about not sort of sleeping in public spaces. Yeah? And if you go to sleep in a general public space, like the street, yeah, or, or outside, you know, people will come and move, you know, something will happen. You will not be just allowed to be there. You will already become very socially excluded when you do something. In the gallery space, it is possible. So these levels of pleasure and pleasure show very successfully renegotiated them. Now, we felt slightly uncomfortable. She said she felt uncomfortable because we experienced this readjustment, this retuning of levels of repression. Someone came in and said, well, I can turn down my repression in this case and turn up the volume of pleasure. And that's what happens, yeah? So that's one way to understand this performance. And I was said earlier, I think that the, the white cube, to the extent that it is like an egg, it is like a womb, is an environment where 
there is a possibility of raising the volume of pleasure and turning down the volume of the reality. Turning down the where you can behave in ways that social norms forbid, but within the space of the gallery is possible. The same thing happens in the carnival. If anyone been to the Notting Hill carnival, for instance, yeah? Or, but, 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 but what is a carnival? A carnival is a sort of, in, in terms of pleasure and reality principle, is an environment where reality principle is suspended and pleasure principle becomes basically the only way to come. And everything you do is to do with pleasure. You dance, you sing, you eat fried chicken, if that's your thing. Uh, and you know, you meet people, you hug, you kiss, you, you know, it's all about... That's, that's the reality principle. <laughs> um, and then, notice what happens in a club, in a rave, in a carnival, at the moment when it stops. See how lost people become. Because for six hours or 48 hours, you were in this embryo-like, baby-like state of pure pleasure. Suddenly, the music stops. Suddenly, you need to gradually readjust yourself to reality principle. It's hard. A good, a, a good DJ is someone who knows how to negotiate this passage. So by the time the music really stops, they already took you from the pleasure into reality. You know, they played some, I don't know, uh, country songs, for instance. <laughs> Which they do. Uh, and, and that is very interesting how... Yeah, anyway, I think that is said in my Now, now we, we don't <laughs> do very, very um, well with reading this essay. I thought we would finish it today. Um, Okay, I want to read five and six, and then we we'll see if we want to spend another week on that to move to something else. So, section five on education, slightly more relevant to us. Can someone read education? Yes. Um, education can be described without more added as uh, incitement to be the con quest of the pleasure principle and to its replacement by the reality principle. It thinks that is to lend its help to the developmental process which affects the ego. To this end, it makes use of an offer of love as a reward from the educator, and uh, it therefore fails if a spoiled child thinks that it possesses that love in any case and uh, cannot lose it whatever happens. Thank you very much, Hong. Um, what do you think? What does it say about education? How Freud understands education through the pleasure principle and the reality principle. What is education according to Freud? Formation of the reality principle. Exactly. To educate someone is to teach them to stop with pleasure and to get on the reality train. Yeah. Um, conquest of the pleasure principle, learn how to conquest your urges for pleasure. So what is happening in school? You know, the first thing you learn is be quiet, sit down, don't get up until the end of the lesson, don't speak until the teacher gives you permission. So all your urges are suppressed. Can I go to the toilet? Your most basic urge to go and urinate, yeah, which of course connected to pleasure, yeah, is monitored and policed by the teacher. Now sit down. 
can go to the toilet. You cannot go to the toilet. Yeah? Which is think about what think about what it means when someone tells you that you may not go to the toilet. Yeah? How it connects to the stage. And now you are in say seven year old when you go to school for the toilet. Maybe it's uh, maybe this country is earlier. Five. Well, what, what age you go to school in China? Six. Six, five. Three? Yeah. It's got Singha. It's got Singha. It's got Singha. No water. <laughs> you, you, you are so good. <laughs> so they really start impressing the pleasure principle at a very young age. In the country, right? In the country, right? In the country, right? But school? Primary school, seven. Seven, yeah? Seven. Okay, yeah. So, Imagine you are set because in the kindergarten, I think there's probably, I don't know how it is, but I think in the, I, I went to a terrible kindergarten in Soviet Russia. But um, I will tell you what it was. It was, <laughs> it was bad. But I think a normal kindergarten, if a child wants to go to the toilet, they can go to the toilet, no? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, but, but, <laughs> but in. Uh, in a school, in a class, someone else basically tells you whether you can go to toilet or not. Think about what it means for a seven-year-old. Think about how it reminds you of the moment when your parents told you to go to toilet when you were, let's say, 12 months old or 16 months old. How it brings back these very early memories of how suddenly you were bad for soiling your nappies or something like that. Yeah? And how this discipline through controlling your bodily functions is, is making you feel ashamed of your own body. And because you feel ashamed of your own body, you start to feel that you are disgusting. And because you feel that you are disgusting, you become very easy to manipulate. Hmm. Yeah? When you become easy to manipulate, they can make you into a worker, then they can make you into a soldier, they can make you into you know a supporter of a party. It all begins from first you need to learn to despise yourself. Then you will obey anyone who appears to have the authority. So what education is in psychoanalytic terms is teaching you how to control and suppress pleasure. And it's interesting that he says here, Freud, that um, the reward for suppressing pleasure is the love of the teacher. So you get a gold star in your notebook. Yeah, as an expression of teacher's love. Yeah? So you give up on your own pleasure in reward, and as a reward you get a kind of ersatz, substitute, the teacher's love. Yeah? But you give up on your love of yourself in order to get this love of the teacher. Okay? Is that what you think about? Yeah. It's good, no? Yeah. I, I think that it's uh, quite interesting to see uh, how different uh, Freud and uh, Plato to see education. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. Very nice. Very nice. Exactly. <laughs> the thing is that people often say, oh, everything that Freud said about sexuality, you can already find it in Shakespeare, you can find it in, the, in great literature or in painting. And it's true, you know, it's true. But Freud taught all of us how to see that. So you don't need to be Shakespeare now to, to see these things. Freud gave all of us these tools. That's what I think is so interesting. And you are absolutely right. Uh, the difference between Plato and Freud here is very stark. Um, so, what do you think about what Freud says here about, about education in relation to this seminar? In order 
to retain the pleasure of making you feel like I am achieving this, I have to let go and no longer um, have to abandon my own principles in order to be um, the reward of your approval. Well, I think the goal of the seminar in general is to, in a sense, undo the damage of education. All of us are victims of very bad education. All of, more education. all of us were told what to think, but not how to think, you know? And that's why I, I really think that the art school is one of the few places where some kind of healing of this bad education can happen. Therapy is another thing. Um, now let's go to, sec to section six, which is it's about art. Okay, this, uh, this is what we were reading it for all along. Now, um, let's get this out of the way. So, oh, so, <coughs> so, could someone read to us this very important section about art? from the perspective of um, um, pleasure and reality principles. Oh. Okay, I'll just... Art brings about a reconciliation between the two principles in a peculiar way. An artist is originally a man who turns away from reality because he cannot come to terms with the renunciation of instinctual satisfaction with it at first demands, and who allows, who allows his erotic and ambitious wishes full play in the light of fantasy. He finds the way back to reality, however, from this world of fantasy by making it of special gifts to mold his fantasy into fruits of a new kind, which are valued by men as precious reflections of reality. Thus, in a certain fashion, he actually becomes the hero, the king, the creator, or the favorable, or the favorite he desired to be, without following the one roundabout path of making real alterations in the external world. But he can only achieve this because other men feel the same dissatisfaction as he does with the renunciation demanded by reality. And because this dissatisfaction which results from the replacement of the pleasure principle by the reality principle is itself a part of reality. So that's quite dense. There's a lot there. Anyone has any thoughts initially? Uh, Art is a special case, no? Yes. So? I um, just want to say I found that uh, it's uh, interesting um, <laughs> to see a lot of artists uh, um, taking um, advance, taking advance that um, the audience um, will appreciate their shit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's when I showed you Manzani's work, Artist Street, yeah. last week. Yeah, but let's go through it line by line, really see what's going on here. So, can someone read? The only the first sentence. Thank you. Art brings about art brings about our reconciliation between the two principles in a peculiar way. Okay, so we get here. Freud says that art has a special relationship, or art has a very special way of dealing with pleasure and reality. And the second, the next sentence. Do you want to continue? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Okay. An artist is originally a man who turns away from reality because he can't come to terms with the renunciation re yes. of his future, of his action which it at first demands, and who allows his erotic and ambitious wishes to play in the life of fantasy. Okay, so who is an artist? A man. A man. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, yes. 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 I, I'm glad we cleared that. Yeah, okay, so. But once that little thing is out of the way, but what kind of man? Uh, an artist 
is originally someone who turns away from reality. Yeah? Why? Because he cannot accept the rejection of the pleasure principle that reality demands. Yeah? So artist is someone for whom this demand to stop with stop all this pleasure business, stop all this enjoyment, get real, get you know, sit straight, don't talk, for whom these rules, these social rules that restrict pleasure are difficult to accept. Yeah? So an artist is someone who doesn't want to grow up. In a sense, you remember what Picasso said, we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, that it takes a long time to become a child. Yeah? It's kind of, it's a little bit along these lines. An artist is originally someone who turns away from reality because they find it impo it's impossible, the demand, to reject pleasure. Yeah? And because the artist rejects reality, he continues living in the world of fantasy in which his erotic wishes come to fruition. So an artist is someone whose way of dealing with reality, which is unbearable, is to fantasize about a different environment yeah, in which they have continuous access to pleasure. Now, then the next sentence, so is, is that clear so far? Yeah, and that's quite interesting. Now, I, and he says something about all of us here around the table. Perhaps something that we all have in common is that we don't, we are not that happy with the social demand to completely abandon the pleasure principle or to only keep it for these sort of specified moments. Yes? So I, well, I didn't I didn't quite hear the last part you said. Are you saying that there are some artists who don't deal with pleasure? Yeah, Whose work is painful? That they are enjoy praising the style and enjoy uh, make the the leader like share for like just to like who for instance uh, I can't think of that like so it so it's so art some like the the painters they but they the artists use the word you you mean artists to sort of celebrate society yeah. Yeah. celebrate the leaders well, yeah. but in, in what sense are they artists, though? Maybe they are just technicians. But yeah, they think themselves are arts in some way. Well, okay, look, obviously it's one paragraph about art, and uh, I think what Freud has in mind, because he did write quite a lot about art, he has in mind writers, poets, painters, sculptors, because in the days when he wrote this, cinema didn't even exist yet. Yeah? Yes. What about people who, in their uh, renunciation of reality and embrace their own desires, and not just imposing their desires on others? For example, people like uh, Sylvia Berlusconi and yeah. Trump. These are all people who basically wanted to make their own reality. Yes. It was a, yes. Someone who said that. Um, yes. But I, and it's true. And, and, and but what. What Freud is talking here specifically about art is that an artist, and we we'll see it in the next sentence. Well, why, why don't you read the next sentence, uh, Jamie? Uh, in terms of when he says he finds the way back to reality, however. He finds the way back to reality, however, from this world of fantasy by making use of special gifts to mold his fantasies into truths of a new kind, which are valued, which are valued by men as precious reflections of reality. Okay, so you see, one second. So, at the third stage, the artist is someone who rejects the reality principle, who, who is not prepared to let go of pleasure, 
and we reject the reality principle because it demands abandoning pleasure. And the artist is someone who uses their special gifts in order uh, to uh, make his fantasies into objects, into truth of a different kind that are valued by people, by men again, uh, as reflections of reality. Yeah? So in a sense, the artist is a person who continues to live according to the pleasure principle and in a sense uh, while all of us are become you know functioning members of society the artist does something that we value because it reminds us that the world could be a different place the world could be a place with more pleasure yeah um, it's true that Berlusconi's and maybe also serial killers are people who want who have other ways to prolong the pleasure principle. But we're not talking here about them, you know? Yeah. We talk here about those people like us who use our special gifts to create various things or objects or experiences that remind people that another reality is possible. So could someone read or Jamie, if you don't mind continuing? Yeah, sure. uh, uh, yeah. Thus. thus, in a certain fashion, he actually becomes the hero again creator, or the favorite he desired to be, without following the one roundabout path of making real alterations in the external world. Okay, so here's the difference between Berlusconi and an artist. Berlusconi is someone, or let's say, uh, someone like, um, I don't know, all these kind of... Um, no, not semi fascistic but all these big magnates and people who build these big empires or become billionaires, they are also people, like artists, who want to, who don't want to abandon the pleasure principle. But all these Berlusconi's, they achieve that by physically changing the world and making, making interventions into reality in order to achieve that. So you want to live in a world of pleasure, you go and you make so much money that all your wishes can come true instantly. So you, you keep your reality, you keep your pleasure principle by making changes in reality. So you actually have to work really, really hard with reality in order to mold it to your idea of pleasure. An artist takes a different route, which you might say is kind of easier, because an artist is not changing the world to to fit their idea of pleasure. The artist just fantasizes about a better world for themselves, and then uses their gifts to make these fantasies into objects. Yeah, but the objects the artist makes are they kind of, of course they are in the real world, but in a very small sense. Because you might make, you know, a little thing put in the gallery. You don't like, go and make, you know, build a newspaper empire or something like that, you know? So both the Berlusconi and Otra and the artist want to live according to the flesh principle, but they do it in different ways. The Berlusconi's change the world. The artists just fantasize about a different world and make objects based on the fantasy. <coughs> yeah? Uh, so you can then look at something like, uh, I don't know, <coughs> Botticelli's birth, birth of Venus. For instance, I don't know why I thought about that. Yeah? No, that's, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> really, really terrible tension. What about this? Yeah? Um, and you can say, well, oh, that's also really bad. What, what, what's wrong with this? Uh, is there a big one? <laughs> uh, 
take the safe section. <laughs> Well, um, is it this one? Is it this one? Yeah. Hello. Uh, so, you can look at this and think about Cherry's birth of Venus in terms of the reality principle and the pleasure principle. So, if someone like Berlusconi wants, you know, to live in a world of pleasure, they don't be make their millions, and then they surround themselves with these sort of naked women and singers and dancers, and they, they basically live in this world they imagine. The artist, the painter, doesn't have the abilities to interfere in the world that they All they do is they fantasize about it. They say, wouldn't it be really nice, you know, to have something like this? And then they make a picture. Yeah? So, they both, you see that it's a very different way of dealing with pleasure. You don't, the artist simply dreams up a better world than the one dictated by the reality principle and then goes and makes this and makes an image based on that fantasy. Yeah, again, think about shoe installed from last Monday. Yeah, which is a bit like the Venus thing. It's a, it's, it is a real intervention in the world, but on a very small scale, it's really like giving a physical expression to a fantasy, to a, even to a dream in that case. Sure, would you agree with that? Sorry? No? Do you want to explain? Okay, okay, fine. Uh, so, just to finish this paragraph, and then we we'll discuss what we're going to do next. Um, so, could someone read uh, the next sentence? But he can only achieve this. Shall I? Please, yes. But he can only achieve this because other men feel the same dissatisfaction as he does with the renunciation commanded by reality. And because that dissatisfaction, which results from the replacement of the pleasure principle by the reality principle, so that explains, so far we spoke about what causes someone to become an artist, which is the desire to, you know, stay with the pleasure principle for longer. And so the, the last sentence talks about the audience. Why don't we go and see art? So what Freud says about that? What attracts people to art, according to Freud? Can someone say it on this part of the room? Anyone has any thoughts? Yes? Common sense from each other. Can I say, getting up really is healing. Well, look, look at what he says here. He can only achieve this because other men, who are the people who go to each other, yeah, uh, feel the same dissatisfaction as the others with the rejection of reality. With the, with the rejection of pleasure demanded by reality, and because this dissatisfaction results from the replacement of the pleasure principle by the reality principle is itself a part of reality. So the reason what the artist does gets an audience is because, in a sense, the artist expresses the wish that everyone has to have more pleasure and less reality in the life. Yeah? So that's why we go to the gallery. Because the gallery is a site where reality is suspended on or bracketed out. Now, that could be really interesting for those of you who think about your research paper. It could be really interesting to think about, about this Freudian way um, in relation to, for instance, performance art that often is quite unpleasant and quite much to do with pain. So, is, does it mean that Freud is wrong? Or is there a different way of thinking about it? I will just leave it as an open question for you to, uh, to think about. Some of you have experience in doing performance that can be quite physically 
painful and challenging. So is that still an expression of pleasure? Because the pleasure principle. Or are we talking here about something else? Yeah? Um, so uh, we need to finish. I just want to ask you, what do you want to do? We have, we could read it through this. There's a couple of paragraphs left. Or we could move to, uh, to something else. What is your thing? Maybe we can move Okay. But, 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 okay. Thank you, Nico. Anyone else? What do I think? I'm, I don't know what the next thing is. So if I'm you ready? No? You ready? Yeah. But you, some of you ready? Yes. Oh, what well, the next thing? Let's say the next thing is anti mm -hmm. uh, You want that? Yeah. That will come. But when it begin to be Okay, I will, I, will, I will send you uh, anti uh -huh. and you will finish this, yeah. and then hopefully we we'll also move to uh, to the version of what is uh, uh, anti Okay, so, uh, Pat and I are going to have a quick chat with you. So this is just for the MA Photography students. Thank you.